Before I start, can I call up uh, Chief uh, LaForme? Stacy? <laughs> uh, so yesterday, uh, Miss Saga was um, gifted at a drum, uh, one of these drums, and to us, uh, and my cousins are at the table there. That's a that's a big that's a big thing for us. Uh, if you know the story of the drum. Uh, it, it's, it's something to our people that brought uh, peace and stability. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chief and his council for doing that and really going out to do that and beyond that. And uh, I just want to uh, follow protocol and our protocol and um, just do an honor song in honor of that. My name's uh, Brent Niganabi. I'm, I'm from Mississauga First, First Nation. Uh, so that's n about nine, eight hours away from here. It's on the North Shore of Lake Huron. So, my name is Doma and Tuna Nishtakaz, Neme Dorim, Mizawi Nojaba, Michi Sagi Anishnabek. So, this is uh, the traditional way we said uh, Mississauga. Mississauga is kind of a corruption. Uh, the French and English couldn't really say it properly, so uh, they, when, when the British did write it down, that's the way they spelt it at the bottom here. But here is uh, a more modern way, and here's how we used to refer to it. So the proper way of saying that is Mizaying. Mizaying is talking about the mouth of the river, and that's where we were uh, originally lived for our summer area because we had two two areas. Our, our territory is quite vast. Our, we have our traditional territory and then we have a specific land claim where because uh, we signed the 1850 Robinson Huron Treaty. Uh, 
So the Mississaugas are, are a sect of the o Ojibwe nation and the larger Anishinaabek nation. We kind of have uh, our own di uh, distinct dialect. Uh, we, we talk a little uh, different than the rest of the Ojibwe's in, in our area. Uh, we were originally located north uh, throughout the area, but according to our stories, when people traveled um, to come see us for ceremonies, because people came from all over. So Mississaugas were living in southern Ontario, uh, and they only came down for feasts and other large uh, ceremonial gatherings. But we did allow the Erie to come into, uh, which is the Peterborough area and, and Toronto area, to plant corn. Uh, once they started having success with that, other nations started coming in, and that's where five nations came in. And we all had agreements with them. I know they were talking about earlier about the, uh, or yesterday about uh, one dish, one spoon. And that was a, a, a treaty that we did, uh, our government, uh, governments, uh, um, both nations agreed upon, but they still needed permission to come hunt into territory. And the protocol was for that was they would come uh, a few kilometers out, light a fire, we would send someone out. And if it was a time of peace and, and a time of goodwill, then we would allow them to come into the territory and hunt and just take what they, uh, just enough of what they needed. So it wasn't, uh, one dish, one treaty wasn't just come into the territory whenever you want and take whatever you want. That wasn't our understanding of that. Um, so a little bit about myself before I start. Um, so I, I lived in Mississauga First Nation my, most of my life. I only went to school in Peterborough. So I went to um, Fleming University and then I graduated from Trent University with honors in Indigenous Studies with a minor in Sociology, I have a BA. And then I, uh, my plan was always to move back home. So I moved back home and I work currently for Nog de Windeman, um, which is a child wealth organization and it's a First Nations child wealth organization. We serve seven First Nations uh, across the North Shore, which is from Sudbury to the Sioux and that's a, a pretty large area. Uh, next slide. So I just wanted to explain my presentation format. I, I do have um, an academic background, but I, I really wanted to concentrate it on um, traditional history. So I put that first and then used historical documents, some historical documents just to um, support that. But I, I think I hold traditional knowledge almost the same as, as my um, university degree. Uh, I was taught at a very young age, my aunts and uncles and, and others' family uh, still had some of the traditions in their family. So, I mean, that's, that's where I, I got a lot of um, my knowledge from. So that's what I'm really uh, wanna, wanna focus on. And lastly, I'm gonna end off with some Mississauga traditional stories. We do have a lot of stories in our community that are just distinct to our community. So I wanna use those and just talk about uh, how they tell history and those are important. Because a, a few years ago, like in the 90s, they started to disappear and people started to forget some of them. So uh, I went along to diff various elders and collected a lot of the stories and I seen a lot of um, importance in those and I didn't want them to be, to be lost. So I just wanna share those and make sure that those continue on. I think this is a good place for that to happen. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna go. So I, I think it is really important that we um, tell our own stories. You know, there, there's a presumption underlying that we, we've lost some of our culture and history, but um, I hope this presentation shows that we, we still retained a lot of it. Um, so when Western historians, and I have some surveys and archeological um, documents here coming up, but um, a lot, there, there's some inaccuracies and they make uh, some assumptions in those. I can actually fill in those spots by the traditional knowledge that I have and the elders that I've spoken to say, oh, well, this is what, this is what it actually was. <clears throat> um, so in saying that, a lot of the things that we still do, um, this is me and my uncle here. We, we still traditionally hunt in our area a, a lot. And some of those guys, um, like my uncle um, uh, Randy taught me, and my uncle um, uh, Ron, go into traditional territory, and they'll say, um, like, 
uh, well, we don't really traditional hunt anymore and we lost some of our things, but everything that they do is, is tradition. Uh, they're, they're quite skilled and, and quite, it's quite a labor intensive thing to do. Uh, you have to go out at say five, four in the morning, you call, um, wait till the light comes up at eight, hopefully the moose comes out. If you do take one, that's the, the rest of your day right there is harvesting a moose and that takes, we're probably done by six o'clock. So you start at six and end at six. Um, if you shoot, if, if, if you shoot one at, uh, just before it gets dark, because that's, those are the best times to hunt, uh, then, then you're going to be there for most of your night. And a lot of their knowledge was handed down from elders. They learned from elders and, and elders before them. So it comes down from family, from family, family. And then they, they taught me a lot of theirs. Um, knowledge about how to hunt and and how to get moose into certain areas. They can get them close to the road. Not anybody uh, can do that. They can um, they could uh, call them and keep them and throw around their calls. Uh, it, it's really quite interesting. They also know uh, where a moose is going to come out. They can almost think like a moose and know where he's going to come out and set someone up that way. Or if you injure a moose and he leaves, then they know how to track them. So, I, and a lot of them all do the same, the same um, tradition when they do harvest the moose. What they do is they take out the heart and they cut the tip off and then they stick tobacco in it and then they put it on a branch. And that's traditionally what we've, what we've done for um, hundreds and hundreds of years. And, and they say, well, we don't really do ceremony after we shoot moose well. And then they're cutting out the heart and they're sticking this tobacco and put it on there. So that to me is tradition. Those are things that, that are important that we, uh, that we do keep alive. And uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on there was the uh, Thunderbird symbol, but I'll get more into that. And why that symbol is so important to the Mississaugas and why we sign treaties with that. And I think some of that knowledge was lost because I heard them talk about um, it was an eagle, it was other things, but it was a thunderbird, and, and I'll get into a, a, a story here a little bit later and explain that. Uh, next slide. So my family background, here's my grandpa Eli. Uh, this is the Morning Stars. This is my grandpa, we affectionately called him Jija. I actually didn't know his real name was Russell until a few years ago because they just referred to him as Jija. And I don't even know what that really means, but that's what they called him. And then that's my grandma Jesse and my grandma Alice. And so my father's side is um, Niganobs and their Sturgeon clan. My mother's side is uh, Bear clan. They're, called, they're uh, referred to as Wabanungs and they were medicine, medicine people. Uh, Ernest uh, was one of the last ones to, to uh, shake and tent was going to be handed down to him, but he, um, he ended up not doing it. So uh, it's starting to come back within the family. I have my um, auntie Ernestine and others who still practice. Uh, so both sides of my family did practice our, our cultures and have respective ties to our clans. Traditionally, it was um, our aunts and uncles who, who took in the, who, who taught the children and disciplined the children. It would be the, the father's brothers who would discipline the children, and it would be the uh, mother's sisters who did a lot of the, the child rearing. The parents traditionally weren't really involved with the Mississaugas. Mississaugas are kind of distinct like that. The grandparents raised the children. Uh, traditionally, uh, if you go back hundreds of years, it, it would be the parents would be out hunting and gathering, so they would save the children. And that's why with the Mississaugas, it's kind of, uh, we refer to seven grandfather teaching as grandmother teachings because it was the grandmothers who were in the lodge teaching the children. And grandparents had, uh, especially with my family, um, both, both grandparents uh, did a lot of the um, child rearing and they, uh, uh, my grandpa Eli, here even came in and lived with us for a while uh, just so that knowledge would be passed on and it was important to them to tell stories to kids and a lot of my aunts and uncles um, uh, sometimes talk negatively about that like they say well why didn't you teach me any stories but it was the it was the grandparents teaching their children so so uh, our gender roles and responsibilities were uh, different in, in our society too. They're a little more uh, affluent and this is more distinct to us because if you go on man to an island, uh, women in those, in those societies, 
uh, had had the responsibilities of water and didn't hunt. But with the Mississaugas, it, uh, it was a two parent unit. So our, um, in my family, like my grandma Alice here at the bottom and then my grandma Jessie, my grandma Alice trapped till she was 70, went off to the bush on her own and, and continued even uh, harvesting moose and deer. And my, um, my, fa my grandma Jessie, until she passed, uh, did the same thing too. So they, I, when I was growing up, um, they were the ones who pushed culture uh, on me a lot and, and taught me. It wasn't my, my uncles didn't come in the wrong, around until later with the lodge and other things like that. But it was mainly my grandparents, I mean my grandmothers who, who kept our culture alive and, and kept that um, distinctiveness for Mississauga alive. <laughs> And, uh, and traditionally, women controlled the food economy. So when we ever shoot a moose, it's my aunts, or if we catch fish, it's my aunts, and, uh, and now my daughters um, who help clean, who process the game. And they controlled the economy by doing that because they're the ones who handed out meat. Like my wife still does that today. I just go shoot the moose and put them in the freezer. But my wife controls the meat and the economy, that food economy, that's important. They were the ones who said where that goes. It goes to this family. This family needs it. Uh, she's always, like, half our freezers is always full at the beginning of the season, but it's empty by the end of the season because she's fed most of her, <laughs> her family. So, uh, next, next slide. So I just wanted to show you, here's our um, Robinson here on annuity payments. I know it's a little bit hard to see, but um, right here is, this is, uh, 18, 1890, and then this one is 1900s, and this one is 1937. So here we see uh, Niganobs were on there, and they spelt their name. So uh, the government official would just come around and ask them what their name was. They had no idea how to spell it, so they would just say, uh, as close as they could, say letters. And then, uh, and as you could see it, it starts to change here. And then, uh, these are the, the, the there's our two families that are uh, separate, but they're almost spelled the same. And then over here, uh, you can see that they put it to English. Uh, Sagis is, uh, is, we're related to the Sagis is too. Uh, there's Joseph Niganob, so they started taking first names now and adding it to their last name. Uh, over here, Morningstar's are Wabanung, and then you can see they put it to English, uh, Morningstar. And this is when they did membership, they started registering these last names here. So you can see the difference of just, uh, they, didn't, they didn't know English and they didn't know how to write it. So it was just whoever shows up and writes down whatever and you check mark it off. Uh, next slide. So here's our, um, our traditional territory. So each family had, a, had an area. Uh, the Morningstar traditional area was north of White River, so this is called Kindiogamy. Kindiogamy means there's something in the lake. My mother's family side uh, hunted and fished there, and they still do. Here's, uh, this is Aubrey Falls in the area. This is my daughter blueberry picking, and where we blueberry pick is um, where the loggers come in, and you can see this is clear cut. So if you went out to the highway and looked over to the next field, that's how far they clear trees in our area. So they come in and that's where usually blueberries grow and where we moose hunt and do those. So we do utilize that. And we usually have to go in there and pick blueberries before they come in and spray because they still spray in, in Northern Ontario uh, herbicides. Um, so the morning stars were one of the last families who actually canoed the, the Mississauga River. Uh, so that was in the early um, 19th century, they were still depending on that economy of, of trapping before it, it went away. And the stories that I grew up with was that uh, th they would always tell me about canoeing and my grandparents uh, and then even with their children um, remember canoeing at night because it was, it was illegal um, for them to do what, what they were doing during war times. Uh, we didn't get our rights back and with the Sparrow case until the early 90s and 80s. We still, we still continued um, hunting and, and trapping though. Uh, and the ministry was often in the area and they would harass us. And my grandma would tell me stories of them even being shot at by the ministry. So they would go down at night 
they would travel at night. They would find a place on the river, stay there until nightfall, and they'd come down in the dark, uh, navigating the river. But they knew the, the river well enough. Uh, even to this day, they still talk about certain, certain areas of the river that they know. And what they would do is um, stuff the furs in their clothing so if they ever did get caught and in the children's clothing, and then they'd come down and, and trade those furs. And, um, the, and the ministry did, uh, if we did shoot a moose on the reserve during these times and trying to feed our families during these hard times, especially during the Depression, the ministry uh, was known to come onto the reserve too and, and look for moose. Uh, one time my uncle said that they came and raided the home looking for a moose that was shot in the area because they did find uh, the gut sack. So they thought it was my grandparents, and my grandparents did have a, I'll admit, did have a hand in that, uh, trying to feed their family. So they raided the house, and they went and looked through the whole house, and then they were mad, and they left, and they, they told us, they, they thought that they knew what we were up to uh, with my grandparents. Uh, the whole time, there was a moose roast in the oven, and they didn't check the oven. <laughs> Uh, so the Niganob traditional area is called um, Caribou Corner, and we've referred to as Camp 17. This is more on the um, uh, the eastern side of of the of our traditional territory, and this and the Mississauga tra tra traditional territory stretches 242 uh, kilometers. So that's just south of Shaplo. So to to encompass our whole territory, when we go up into our territory and go uh, moose hunting, it usually takes us two hours to get up there. And if you go from east to west, that's another uh, two hours. So usually we stay up there. We stay up there. Um, I, I take a week off work. And we stay up there for a whole week. Uh, and then on the weekends, we'll go blueberry picking during certain times. Uh, so in, traditionally in the area where, we, where uh, my family was on Caribou Corner, it's called Caribou Corner because there's actually, there was actually caribou in the area. There was wood buffalo in the area. There was elk. Uh, moose, deer, uh, the caribou is gone, the elk's gone, the wood buffalo is gone due to overhunting, but we also had um, two large fires in the area that um, uh, drove the populations out and they've replaced the, the um, they're starting to try to bring back the elk. Next slide. So um, this here is uh, caribou cornice on top of the river. Uh, on top of a rock where we stayed, and this, and this is um, the river here. Uh, this is my daughter up, up on uh, one of the, the creeks up in our area. So uh, traditionally, the majority of Mississaugas uh, only inhabited North Shore of Lake Huron only during the summer months. After the ghost feast, Mississaugas would travel inland and up the Mississauga River to hunt and fish and trap. Uh, some of the families did stay behind because they were traveling by canoe. So it would be young, young babies or elderly um, uh, who were sick, too sick to travel. We didn't, uh, and we just didn't leave them there. The family, they would designate somebody to stay with them. And they would stay, and uh, traditionally they, they thought we had bark uh, uh, homes, but uh, wigwams, but we, we actually did build A-frames cabins and dug them out with logs and the purpose for those was uh, because this we, the reason why we went inland is because it, uh, if you stayed on the shore of Huron when the winter came uh, it would be uh, it was a harsh harsh winter there so we needed that protection so we built them those types of homes but also in times of war when we were at war with uh, five nations and throughout our history we we uh, we were and they would send down different people uh, our different nations would come in uh, raids. So you wanted to be hidden. So the, these, uh, if, if you go by the river by these um, A-frames, you can't see because they were covered with moss. So that was uh, another uh, reason for building those types of uh, cabins too. So the Mississaugas would break up into uh, macro groups to micro groups. So during the summer we lived, uh, in the population it's hard to say, uh, it would have been a rather large population. If you see historical documents, they, the numbers are up and down because people were always coming and going. And people would travel, like again, Mississaugas from Southern Ontario would come down to Northern Ontario. So it was, um, so it, it was, uh, the, the population was never really uh, um, uh, known, but it could be supported. 
uh, and then the, the families would break up during the winter time to to the to go to the traditional winter areas. And each family had a, a head of the family, and that's how our, our societies uh, uh, ran. So our First Nations had families that were known specifically for specific roles, according to your clan. So the Niganabis did hunt and fish in the morning. Stars were um, a medicine people. We had Chiblo as in other names, and they had specific roles inside the community to do chiefs and uh, internal, external. So another fre frequent one, winter area was, uh, which ended up turning into a year-round area, was upper and lower uh, Bark Lake, or upper and lower Green Lake. So Green Lake actually had a Hudson Bay post uh, throughout, throughout the 1800s, throughout all of 1800s. And a small group of Mississaugas lived next to that post. Uh, so those Mississaugas uh, were actually taken in the 1861 uh, census for the, for the government. And they're still there today. They lost their status, but it's called Bisco Tasting. And it, it's, it's still on the maps. Uh, there's still some of our last names actually in that area. Uh, but we don't, we, uh, those family ties have kind of broken up and uh, we don't really um, visit that area much anymore. Uh, the, the, the last area I want to talk about here is uh, Rocky Island. So Rocky Island also had a post to it before it went to Green Lake. Uh, we still do ceremony in Rocky Island because uh, it, it, it was an area, it was a conflict between the Crees. So we actually had a conflict, uh, both sides of our territory. Uh, we did have some conflicts with our nations and, and the Crees were though um, buried there. And when we, when we fought with our enemies or if we did have these times of conflicts and it did lead to wars, we just didn't leave our people, uh, even their people, out, out on the battlefield. We buried, we buried them, and we got specific designated areas throughout our territory. I, I know the Niganabis, um, where we live now, is, is one of them. Um, in Blind River, too, where they, uh, there's a town next to us called Blind River, in that courthouse. Uh, we have stories of, of our uh, warriors being buried there with along with the Honi, uh, Honushonis, our other five nations that we did. So we showed immense respect to, to life, and when you took life, that, was, uh, uh, that wasn't a good thing. So we did do ceremonies for them, and we still carry on um, that tradition today. So we, we did actually, my parents, my grandparents uh, on the Morningstar side did have cabins in that area, but the ministry flooded in their early uh, 191900s and uh, they flooded all the cabins and they didn't allow us to rebuild in that area uh, we've, we've kind of since then since we signed our specific um, land claim we have have taken um, some of our, our territory back such as Pishu Lake which is which we call Bijou Lake which is uh, talking about the Black Panther and it has a uh, uh, spiritual stories in our territory. So that's why those areas are, I just want to bring up those areas because those areas are, are important even though they were not as inhabited as, as much as they are uh, now. They were, they were in, in the past. Uh, next slide. So Mississauga's uh, traditional summer, during the summer months, our, our territory was all along the North Shore uh, and it was on the east bank of the mouth of the Mississauga River. Uh, this area was, each year was um, gathered for trapping, fishing, uh, hunting, and, and conducting ceremonies. And then we also frequented the, the um, islands on the mouth of the river. There's quite a few large islands that we have names for, and we use those for fasting in the summer and also for hunting. Our, our meetings during the summer months were very important because that's when we had our governance and our clan meetings, and they'd be held at these times, and different clans would have uh, their responsibilities and have to meet and, and uh, they would settle the issues that might have arisen during the fall and winter time. So the head men for each family, our, our, our head people would bring those to forward to the, the greater council and, and those issues would be dealt with and if there was a wrong then compensation would have to be paid for that. That's how we handled our, our traditionally things. So some islands on the mouth of the river, uh, we don't do this. We were actually doing this in the 50 those. Uh, we, we control burns for the, these islands. And this was primarily done to grow blueberries. Blueberries are uh, a staple for us, and we still do this today, still 
pick blueberries and, and travel very far to do that. And one of the things uh, interesting about the island is that there's Mississauga rattlers. So Mississauga rattlers are not found anywhere else. They're only found in Perry Sound and Bruce Palinza, but they're only found on this island, which is, is, is a little bit a ways out from our territory. And the reason why the Mississaugas actually took the snake and put them there was to protect those blueberry plants from other animals and uh, to, to assure that we had a large sustainable crop there. So we were actually engineering um, uh, the environment in, in, a, in a manner to, that, that was healthy, that was natural, but we, we were doing things, uh, um, complex things like that. Uh, so, uh, each family also had uh, um, sugar bushes in the area uh, further inland, uh, and that was a, another thing that's um, still done today, and each family had a designated area. So a family wouldn't go into another family's area. Uh, it was uh, meant just for that family, and whatever crop they took and, and whatever um, maple syrup they took was for them, and they can use it for trade or, or other things. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, where we fished was the falls and this is right beside our traditional area and also Red Rock Dam so sturgeon was quite plentiful there I don't know if you guys know Science North it's, uh, it's more than a child um, uh, theme park There's a, they actually do some science there and if you go there they discuss about um, how plentiful the sturgeon was in the area the sturgeon was so plentiful, they said when it was spawning season, it almost looked like a, a bridge, like you can walk across the river. Uh, since then, our, our population is fine in our river, but the surrounding uh, areas have, have dropped significantly. And there, there's various things that I, I was uh, overfishing. Um, at one time, Europeans were using them for oil lamps. So they were taking the sturgeon and using them for oil. And this depleted uh, a lot of the, the population, but in our area, it's still, we, we still do, uh, the sturgeon fish are, are all right in our area. And we traditionally, we did it with spears. And it was, there was enough sturgeon to feed a large population. But there's also pickerel and red suckers, that uh, white fish, other, other things that came down that we would use and, and depending on the season. Uh, so usually we speared by night with torch and that, this is still actually practiced today. Um, some men in the community still spear. You can still go down at certain times, and uh, usually at the end of the year, and see them down there. They have uh, we the torches now were replaced with uh, propane lanterns, and they put tin foil on the sides, and then they put it down, and you have to sit there and wait and wait for them to come around. And the spear has a three prong hook, and then a large spruce or cedar. And what you do is wait for them to come by, and then you push it down, and then you gotta hit them in the back of the neck to paralyze them, and then the end piece comes out and the rope's attached. The older guys used to attach the ropes to trees because some of the sturgeon were larger. Some of the younger guys uh, don't do that anymore, but, and then you would pull the line in, and then that's how we, we uh, fish sturgeon. Uh, for smaller fish, you could use dip net. Uh, that's, dip net's not really practiced. Dip net's been, been replaced by a large, uh, larger net setting. So in that area, we had the Northwest Company and that was located on the East Bank. So again, like, um, like Tom was saying, uh, they came to and lived beside us. We didn't live beside them. They came to us because we were controlling the, the economy at that time and we were good hunters, we were good fishers and we, had, uh, we were able to get the pelts that they were looking for. So they actually put the Hudson Bay Post beside us. Uh, there's no more long, longer remnants of it uh, or the Northwest Company later became. Uh, there's, there is a, a cemetery there, uh, and, it's, uh, and it was the settlers that were living in the area. Some of the names that you still see on our community, so um, Sayers uh, was one of the owners of the Northwest Companies. And uh, the, in Toronto, they still have some of those records, and we've, we've had uh, been given some of those records, and just the, the names inside those, um, those books that, that we were trade and they kept uh, quite detailed records. Uh, next slide. So another Mississauga traditional summer settlement was uh, Big Chiblo. 
and that's located about 20 kilometers north of Mississauga. Up here, this is a, one of the paintings at Chibble Lake. It's a, it's a serpent. You can see his claws here in his head. And those paintings are still there. And throughout the area, though, a lot of people just think that we have paintings here, but we have them actually throughout the area on the Mississauga, uh, Matininda, Flake Lake. Uh, we both have uh, pictographs and uh, uh, petroglyphs. So, and if you ever look for petroglyphs, they're usually on the west side of the lake. And these were just markers to tell us if something happened in the area or if we were going the right, air, uh, uh, right way. Another thing that you don't see because um, up, so up in our northern area was heavily logged. They were after white pine, which is, when I say that today, people are surprised because there's no more white pine in the area. Um, they were, they logged millions and millions of logs and they used the Mississauga River. So we actually lost use, use of it for a while and we had to be careful when we were traveling on the river because they were using it to bring logs down. And Blind River at one time was one of the largest sawmills in all of Canada. So, um, um, but we used to um, bend trees, uh, so there's not too many around us. There is some, we have found some. We used to bend trees, and that would tell you which area to go to. So they're almost like signs. Uh, so the rock paintings uh, have a serpent, a thunderbird, and two men in canoe. And you can also find these paintings throughout uh, where Mississaugas have been or where they've traveled. So that, um, so the, in this area too, there was uh, we grew corn and rice. And if you go on top um, of this, uh, of where these paintings are, it's a large flat rock. And on that flat rock, there's two dugout bowls inside the rock. And those bowls were used for crushing down uh, certain crops that we needed, or other corn, or certain um, cattails, or there was also um, tree bark that they used that, uh, uh, that they can sustain and, and carry throughout the seasons. So that was used for, but uh, another thing that they were, they had dual purposes. Uh, uh, medicine men would also use those too. Uh, they'd be filled up with uh, a certain type of water and, and they would do uh, a ceremonial. So those are ceremonial places there too. Uh, some people still fast in the area and it, it's, it's still used. It's not very far and it's part of our specific land claim when we got back um, some of our land. That was one of the designated areas that we wanted to really protect. Okay, next slide. Uh, so Mississauga today. Um, so we're, we're, we moved to our summer area. Uh, that's where our reserve is located. Uh, we, we signed the Robinson Huron Treaty in 1850. And the reason why we signed that treaty and that treaty came about is because uh, the Queen's representatives were in Bruce Mines, which is about a uh, 40 minute drive from our reserve. And at Bruce Mines, they were mining copper. And the Mississaugas are some of the nations along the North Shore of the Ojibwe's. We were actually the first ones there mining copper. The, they found out about it, and the Queen's representatives, uh, some of her people of her court, went there and started mining those areas. But those, those areas were, always mi were already mined by us, and we had closed them down. So they were repurposing them. So what we did was send down a, a canoe uh, they said three canoe loads of warriors down and told them to cease and desist and to stop because we were we wanted money from those resources. So we understood that uh, to that if they were going to live there, they were going to have to compensate us if they were going to take resources. So we uh, we actually were mining in that, and then that's how this 1850 treaty came about. Right after that happened. And um, some other small skirmishes uh, they signed. And Bonchkeash was the, the one who signed the treaty on our behalf of Mississauga. And the reason why we, we probably chose that area is because it was uh, right next to the lake. Uh, you can do access and there was a, a food supply, especially right near the falls there with the, with the sturgeon and other fish. So ever due to encroachment and, settlement and settlers, Later land was surrendered and we moved further inland from uh, the river and the lake. So that's where it is situated today. We're kind of off the river. Uh, there are some families that's uh, scattered about that still live um, close, but the majority of us are, are on the reserve now. Uh, so, so families were originally spread out through, the, through our reserve. So, and again, 
Um, if you see this throughout our traditional ter 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 territory, and I noticed that it down here too, each family had a designated area. Uh, we just didn't settle down wherever we wanted. We had a designated place for us. So Mississaugas was down the hill. Uh, the Boyers and, um, and Morning Stars were further um, up the river. Uh, when what we were in the reserve uh, came about, and we couldn't leave no more because uh, they enforced a pass system, and that pass system was in place for until the 50s on our reserve. Um, my grandparents remember that they had to ask the Indian agent to leave. Uh, that's why they were usually taken off at, at night to go hunt and fish because they needed that pass to, to leave. An Indian agent wasn't always around or didn't even know who, who you were, so it was hard to get one. <clears throat> and uh, the reserve shrank significantly. Uh, throughout the 18th and 19th century, we were heavily affected by colonialism. So uh, my dad actually went to residential school. My grandparents went to residential school. On my mom's side, my grandparents went to residential school. They went to day school. So that's, uh, and it was hard to hold on to, to certain, um, certain cultural beliefs, but uh, a lot of them did. But we were heavily uh, affected by that. A lot of those people went to residential school. Uh, and came back with post-traumatic stress and came back with uh, alcohol. Uh, my grandpa would, I mean, my Uncle Earl would tell me stories of, uh, like, when my dad and aunties who were older, and he was, and my grandparents, uh, when the Indian agent was coming to, to pick them up to bring them to residence school, my grandparents uh, brought my uncle fishing so he didn't have to go to residence school, and that, that saved him. Um, because he, he said when my grand when my... Uh, Aunts and uncles did come back from residential school. He said they were, they were different. They, uh, they lacked a lot of emotion because of the abuse that they did go through. Uh, in my household, I wasn't allowed to talk about uh, residential school at all. It wasn't, it wasn't mentioned. It wasn't brought up. And that was just uh, that, that was something that my dad uh, really wanted, so we kind of respected that. And... Uh, and he actually went to two residential schools. So he went to St. Joseph, which is only half an hour away from us. And then he was sent to Thunder Bay for until he was 17 and aged out and was sent back to the reserve. So in 1994, after a decade of negotiation, Mississauga had signed a Pacific land claim. And that was surveying. They surveyed our land wrong. And then Blind River uh, occupied half the, the First Nation. So when we, stand, when we signed our specific land claim, uh, we got back some of the area that we wanted. Uh, Blind River was still, um, still sits on that, but we were compensated for that. And with land claim, you just don't get your uh, specific land claim. You don't get the back. They give you money, and then, you're, and then they, ask, they want you to buy back your land. And that's how, that's how land claim works. So what we could, so with our, our, we do have a large land base, but it's kind of a checkerboard because of those, area, because of those issues of not, people not wanting to sell. If they didn't want to sell, they didn't want to sell. Um, so even today, though, um, even though we had a big signing uh, in 94, you know, all the Indian agents came out and the government came out and, and we had a, a large celebration, the province still doesn't, uh, we're still in negotiations with the province. So that was in 94, it's now 2020, and the province today is still uh, not fully recognizing our territory, but we've kind of moved into it and started building and started occupying it. And, we're just going to continue on uh, doing that. So throughout the 90s, because of the, the specific land claims and, and money came in, we actually did um, expand quite a bit. Uh, we, we went from one dirt road with one band office, and in the band office was the school. Uh, we had a daycare with a fire hall, at, uh, fire hall with a daycare at the top. So everything was uh, compact, but now we have our own daycare. We have a large... Um, uh, band office, brand new, that was built. Uh, we have an um, education center, daycares. So we actually jumped ahead of uh, a lot of the reserves uh, along the North Shore in our area. So we were always uh, a, a little more um, ahead because of that. And what we did with that money is, uh, uh, which is actually uh, not done a lot, but we put that money in trust so to build buildings. It just didn't go to each person. Uh, we've seen it as, as a way of, it was meant for everybody. That money was meant for, for the community. So it was put into a trust, and then uh, we, we use it only for, for incidences that we really need and building um, uh, buildings that we need.
Uh, next. So this is, uh, so again, I, um, I just want to breeze through this. This is the historical archaeological surveys that were done in the area. So they, uh, where we traditionally were is now a golf course, and that was um, sold off and surrendered, unfortunately. And, but before they can do that, they did know that they found certain uh, things in the area, and that, again, that's where our traditional area was. So they did uh, commission a, a few um, surveys in the area. There's one in 1975 by Laurentian and one in 1980, and there was one also after that in the 2000s. So in, in those areas, they found um, uh, a rock cut in a cigar-shaped longhouse. And this longhouse was used for white dog ceremony. So uh, I don't want to go into what white dog ceremony is, but it's a ceremony that's not really done today. But this was one of the largest lodges ever found for this ceremony, and it was on this uh, shore. And again, that's because the Mississaugas from Southern Ontario and from all over the area were coming down. And these were large, large, large areas. And this could sustain a large, large population. So abundance of firecrack rock was found in the area. Uh, spearheads, arrowheads. Uh, and then there was various sizes. Uh, uh, and they were small and large. We still have some of those in the community, small spearheads. And they're usually in the white rock. Black, or majority of them are in red. And those larger spears that were used for sturgeon fishing, uh, those are still found in, uh, throughout the river. So El Dorado site uh, pit, uh, in that area there was uh, a wrap decorated stick and they did a lot of carbon dating. So they found that they were from 880 to 1080. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So these are the names here of the areas that they did test. So white-tailed deer, uh, Renard site, Sweet Marie site, and the Moonlight Beach. So again, in these areas, they found abundance of firecrack rock, which was used for lodges. Uh, carbon sampling from the area, from the Renate site, ranges from 800 to 1,000. In the case of the area where it was probably occupied within 200 years of emerging from the, from the lake here on Bison. Uh, so as soon as the uh, basin, so as soon as the um, water, the ice caps receded, uh, we were in the area. Throughout historical documents and interviews, uh, corn and wild rice were grown in the area and harvested. Various pottery, and the pottery was always had a reddish yellowish colors to it. And then down here, they're talking about Patrick Point. And they, they, they didn't even know that uh, we, we were building stone structures. So there is still today, through this island, an old woman island, there's some ceremonial stone structures there. Um, there's ones with seated in a circle, a certain amount of numbers, large rocks. And then there is a large um, stone table. And then in some of those rocks were cut out edged. So those were ceremonial uh, purposes. But they, um, when they did the survey and I was reading through it, they said uh, they were surprised that uh, we had these types of structures they didn't think we made. But again, that's why I mean traditional knowledge will fill in these gaps. Uh, next slide. So there's uh, historical written records. So Champlain, when he came through the area, only mentioned us briefly. And this, was, um, this is the map here, and this is where he marks us right here on the east bank of the Mississauga. <clears throat> so he, he wrote that the place where savages dry raspberries and blueberries every year. And this is, uh, again, from our historical knowledge, too, that that's, that's the area that we were. Uh, next slide. So this slide uh, is, this is, again, another map and were referred to by Jesuits. The Jesuits were in our area quite a bit. And they came through, uh, they mentioned us in 1670. And they write about how we're situ situated on the banks of the East River and it was rich in sturgeon. And also um, a place where they erect cabins. And again, they're talking about those A-frame cabins because this would have been a time of, of uh, when we weren't, we're starting to have conflicts with five nations and they were starting to come down into the area. 
so another Jesuit was uh, Father Andre and an explorer, Henry, Alexander Henry. And they had uh, talked about how they eat and fish at the uh, mouth of the river and as sturgeon fishing amongst the Mississaugas was the basis of the diet during the summer and the summer gathering spots. And the Jesuits throughout the, um, if you want to go and, and read them for yourself, they refer to us three different names. So here's uh, closest to in Mississaugas. This is where probably the corruption uh, word came from. And then here's another way they refer to us. And then this one's pretty interesting because this one's spelled with an O-U. So if you see any of those in the Jesuit diaries, that's, that's us that they're mentioning us. Uh, next slide. So in uh, 1972, here's another map where it shows us again on the East Bank River. And this is from 1710. So we're still heavily in the area. So in, in there, the um, uh, Joint Intendant Commissioner of Canada for the British Crown uh, talked about us coming together on the spring of the bank. So that was for a ceremony. He talked about how we planted corn in the area. And he also said that uh, it was that the Jesuits had mentioned to him that it was um, uh, especially good for sturgeon fishing. And he said that there was 45 to 60 warriors in the area at the time that, uh, that he encountered. But again, this, this, this number, is, there's probably, there was probably more, but they were probably out throughout the territory hunting and fishing. It would have been hard to gauge a number of just the people coming and going and trading. So uh, he mentions that uh, he wrote about the season and moved to, he said, people leave their village and go inland during the winter to hunt. So this was during, this is what I was mentioning earlier about the winter, when my grandparents who told me how we would live. And they, they moved inland, uh, and he insinuated that people stay in the summer in areas. So again, this was talking about the, the sick and the younger who were stayed behind in, in A-frames. And he said that uh, those who stayed were ones who actually could not march up the river. In 1746, settlements shown on the East Bank, and this time at the Advil map and uh, McFadden maps also place us in the exact same area. Uh, next slide. So um, this is my grandfather, uh, Eli. And uh, he came and lived with us for a while and he had traditional knowledge. Um, his, he was uh, a chief of our First Nation for a little bit. So was his, my great grandpa, Alex. And my great grandpa, Alex, uh, was a pipe carrier and conducted ceremonies. Although in the 30s, he kind of um, um, went underground because uh, the church was in the area and, and they were, they, he was being accused of uh, being a witch and other things. But this is where I got most of my traditional knowledge from, was my grandpa Eli. And he actually used to come, he lived with us for a while when he moved back to the reserve, because he had left for a bit. And uh, he would just, he would tell me stories all day, and I was very, very young. I was probably around seven or, or maybe just a little bit older uh, when I started taking interest in going to the lodge in our community. And so he, he instilled a lot of these um, traditional knowledge in me and stories. So my grandfather had traditional views and ideas. And when he was trying to tell me a story, when he'd sit down and tell me a story whenever he wasn't uh, watching MASH, which I just, that show I just hated. He'd watch that show all the time. Or he'd, or he'd watch the uh, news channel, the one that you read. And I, I was young, I didn't know how to read. So he would just sit there, but he would tell me, as soon as this is over, a cartoon comes on. So I'd sit there with him <laughs> for hours on end. <laughs> but when he did tell me stories, he did. Um, he would tell me in a in a in a certain way, and he spoke uh, like the traditional people did. He spoke in metaphors. So w when they did that, they were trying to make us think during stories. Like the stories weren't always meant to be taken literally. Uh, they were meant to be uh, examined and dissected, and, and we were supposed to philosophize about them and, and take what we wanted from them or what we needed. And it was a different understanding because people may take uh, a different view from a story. Uh, so, like, uh, a, a story he told me was about um, the stars. Um, so he, he would say, he would, he would take me out at night, sometimes we'd sit on a porch, and he would say, in the stars, 
they're very important to the Mississaugas. And he had console, um, the layout of stars was done in, in, uh, in a Mississauga traditional way. Like there was different animals and he would tell me, he'd say, well, these stars are this and this stars are that. And then he would say that we were, we come from the stars and they can tell us our future and past. So if you want to know anything, we go in fast and we look out at them. And what he meant by that was, um, technically we, we do uh, um, come from star, stardust and we, um, and in our legends, it is that we return back to the sky world and to the stars and that's where our ancestors were. So that's what he was talking about past and present. I mean, my, my brother there, who's chief of Mississauga, when he was younger, it was funny because he interpreted the story a different way. He thought that we were aliens. <laughs> so he'd always, he'd always say like, well, someday they're going to come and take us away. You know that, right? <laughs> um, so, that, so that's um, how he raised me. So move uh, next. So that's how I kind of want to... Uh, so here's stars. But uh, next slide. So, um, so that's what I, I kind of want to talk about these traditional stories that he handed down to me. And from these stories, we can learn about the Mississauga psyche. We, we can learn that they're filled with historical clues. We can learn about our past. They tell us about our attitudes about life and death. They, we can learn about uh, governance and how they practice it. We can learn about our spiritual beliefs and how they conducted ceremonies through these stories. We can learn how the Mississauga seen themselves in their relationship to the surrounding world around them. Uh, essentially what it is to, to, uh, to be Mississauga. So I'm just going to end here with um, these three stories. And I'll, I'll try to explain them how I interpreted them and how they were passed down from my grandpa to me and uh, in, the, in the community. So the next slide. So an important area in where we are spiritually is called Thunder Mountain. And my mom remembers... My, the Wabanungs, specifically, not the Nignobs, but the Wabanungs, the morning stars being dropped off in the area, and they would travel up to Thunder Mountain, and they would do, conduct ceremonies, and then a couple days later, they would have to drive up there and pick them back up. So they just drop them off with their blankets, and they would go up there and, and conduct these ceremonies. And uh, the legend of Thunder Mountain is that on top of this large mountain, it does look like there's uh, eggs on top of the mountain. And that, that was a, a metaphor for the Thunderbird. And it said that the Thunderbird once um, uh, laid their, their eggs on top of the mountain and the serpent lived under the mountain and the serpent came up and took the eggs and took the Thunderbird and went back down. And when the Thunderbird returned and had no one who'd taken those uh, eggs and they uh, destroyed the mountain. So when you go to the mountain, it looks like a jagged edge is on the rock and that's what that stands for. And, and that was just to tell us, too, like the Thunderbirds are, are gods to us, but even they were affected. And, and bad things happen to, to, to them, too. But we just have to kind of move on beyond that. And also, um, we, we were told by various stories um, of serpents all the time. I, I, like, those were the main stories. And Ernest uh, um, was known for, for telling these stories. And Ernest... Uh, was one of the last ones there to go up there and conduct s ceremonies. And he was chosen to, to do shake and tent because a lot of shake and tent was in our area. Uh, but he, he uh, didn't pass that down. So um, next, next slide. So this is uh, Pink Belly Sturgeon. And this story was told by Tom, Tom uh, Daybutch. And the story speaks to ceremonies uh, and how they did it and what time of the year they did it, except in change in culture. And the story was that uh, when we used to gather in the summer, there was a large um, celebration. And these were clan celebrations. And during these celebrations, young women who were berry fasting couldn't take part. They had to go off uh, to another settlement and stay there while these ceremonies took place. And these ceremonies happened. They were singing and dancing in lodges. And they did this from 6 o'clock at night to 6 in the morning. So all night and all day, they danced and told stories and they um, um, drummed. And uh, especially shakers were, were important. Those were, that's the, th those are, when we use shakers, those are the, the, the creator's thoughts and how we speak to spirits. So during ceremonies, those were important things. And during this ceremony this time, um, 
these women uh, sent, uh, these young girls sent out someone to go look and spy on the ceremony and just didn't come back and tell them what was happening at the ceremony. And while she was walking there, uh, she seen what looked like serpent people coming out of the water and they were, they were uh, I guess, what Europeans would call them, mermen. They came out and they, they were spirit people and they came and told her uh, about the ceremony and that um, it was okay for them to start taking part. And he also told them that uh, the sturgeon in the lake, um, to prove to the people that the sturgeon in the, in the river who have pink bellies are our ancestors. Those are people who have drowned in the river or, or something happened to them. So we never eat those sturgeon. And even today, that's practice. If there's a, a pink belly sturgeon, it's put back into the water. And then, so since then, I mean, women have, uh, young women have been able to take part in, in our certain ceremonies. Uh, next slide. So this is my uh, last slide. And this is the story of Thunderbird. Earlier I mentioned that the Thunderbird was very important to Mississauga and why we signed treaties with it. And this is the main story. And this story tells us, teaches us about Mississauga's perceived governance and justice and leadership. Uh, talks about our communal living and sharing, how we lived and traded goods for economy, the importance of future generations. Uh, in here is our prophecies. This is Mississauga's prophecies. Uh, so this story is that at one time there was a chief who became corrupt with power. And there's no, ever, there's no other dates, like my grandparents didn't say, well, this happened in, you know, 1600s or 16-something. They only gave me time frames. And that's just a, a traditional way that they spoke. Um, so they, they would say that at one time there was a chief who... Um, who became corrupt with power and wasn't sharing resources and was taking others and, and starting wars with other nations without consulting uh, the war chief and other people, governance in the community. And he had dismantled the, the clan system in, in our larger lodge of governance. So for that, for that, the people had gathered and they had traveled down here to southern Ontario and got the best Mississaugas, medicine people that they could. And they were going to teach him a lesson for not sharing resources and for being a corrupt leader. So they were going to turn him into a serpent. And when they were going to turn him into a serpent, they were going to slay him and, and uh, kill him. So they had this plan put in place. The people came down. Uh, they called the large gathering that he was at. And then again, the people turned him into a serpent. But before they can do that, the serpent disappeared into the river. And the people celebrated and we had a celebration like was mentioned earlier all night. And we were happy for that, and we thought that he had gone. But to their unknowing, he, he uh, adapted to that well. And he began, when people went out with their canoes to fish, they began going missing. And then people who went down to the river to fish began going missing. And we needed to travel across the lake with our canoes to gather corn and other things with other nations. And we couldn't do that because those canoes were going missing. So they had to come up with another idea. So they thought, well, why don't we just wait till winter? And when winter comes, we'll cross the ice. So that was the plan. So they waited till winter. And famine had started to go through because they had gotten hungry. And they needed to trade. They needed that, that, that network of trading to depend. So they waited till winter. And then they started to cross the ice. But just as they were got out to the middle of the ice, there was a, a large shake on the ice. And something came busting through the ice, and the serpent began devouring those people, those Mississauga warriors who were going out to get supplies for the people. And then that serpent, when he came down to the last man, um, the last man took out Thunderbird tobacco, and that's uh, dried sumac tobacco. And that's specifically done at the beginning of the year. We put down that tobacco. Um, and the reason is that is when we hear the thunders to welcome those thunder people back, those thunder beings back and the thunderbirds. And then so when that serpent came out and was going to devour the last man, he put down his tobacco, the clouds parted and the serpent, uh, and the thunderbird came down and he took the serpent and he took him away. And then today, so um, it's told, and this is where the prophecy comes in because it's said that when the thunderbird comes back, that's when the Mississaugas will be at where they need to be again. And they'll return back to, to the way we, we lived and the way we were and, and, uh, and accepting uh, our, our position in, in the natural things. Um, so, and then, so later on, when you see that being signed by treaties, 
imagine the French and new people coming in that we didn't even know existed. And then now they're in our territory and we have that symbol and that's what that symbol represents. It's a renewal of things. And that's why we, we, we use that and put that on things. Uh, next slide. So uh, um, I just want to give a, a special thanks to my cousin Cliff, who is a librarian and had some of the historical documents and he helped me with it. But uh, that's it. I'll make it. So on behalf of the committee and the organizers, I'd like to present Brent with the gift on such a great job.